hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I know in there making sure everything's going good. She's watching it there. Okay. So let's get let's go ahead and get uh let's go ahead and get going. Okay. Um tonight we're honored to uh have Michael Young as a guest. Um I won't do a normal bio, but I just have a few things to say about this. I want to thank the partner staff for making this happen and Neil for figuring out. I, I couldn't figure out how to get somebody to come visit. I told Neil about it and he was like, oh, here, here you go. Next thing you know, we have, we have this all arranged. Um, thank you to the Dean's office. He's around the corner here. And um, thank you to my colleagues who are all, all here and the president and the students as well. We've got a class of 40 back there that are all the first year of the grad program. They're in a pro practice class with that. Um, but one of the things that I, I I, the thing that when I go elsewhere and I represent this program that I'm most proud of is that I draw most presence from is that this is the school that still values drawing. And we're a place where we draw to find out, and we draw to think. So what it is, we draw to think and we draw to make knowledge. That isn't as common as some of our recent grads found out as, as we might think it is. It seems so natural here that that's how we think about things and that's how we think through things. But it isn't everywhere like that. Um, and, you know, we, we still understand as that this, this, this act, this practice is the birthright of the discipline and the raison raison debt of the profession. So, it seems like over the last 15 years ago, if you will look at the YouTube symposia, there were symposia about the end of drawing or the death of drawing and all this kind of things was starting to go on. Um, I think what's really beautiful and why we think we're really lucky, lucky to have Michael come here and visit is there's really in reaction to some of that, but I can see the way that we grow things, there's this this group of other voices that I'm starting to bring in this back to this. Oh, sorry, I should no, be over here. Oh, God, I'm just going to minimize that. Tell me to go back to the, my, 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 <laughs> my stage. I got all excited. I was talking to you all. I'm sorry I forgot you all. Are, so I hope, I don't know what you all just heard, but um, so, you know, fortunately, we have people like Michael opening up new yet old vistas in our understanding of the, per, of the, per, of the practice of art of representation. Last year, some of you all who may be here were part of the ED3 drawing course that I taught where we used parts of your book and we talked about the notions of crochet, entourage and mosaic and how, you know, we're a school that's pretty good at what you would call mosaic. I think that's a, that's a unique characteristic to be good at as a school. Um, but we use Michael's book, Reality Model After Images as a key text in getting to know the artificial drawings. Um, Michael comes to us from the his professorship at the Cooper Union, which is a school that is incredibly key to their last 50 years in understanding what drawings are in our, in our discipline. Um, and he also comes to us from his partnership in Young and Ay Ayata. If you want to see more of the details of where he went to school and all that, it's easily available on, on the web. So please, uh, as he brings us a presentation called Estrangement, which by the way, this was like 1994, Columbia, with Michael Hayes and Stan Allen. You know, they, yeah. Anyways, it's it's beautiful to see this. I thought, oh, somebody's still somebody's still doing this, and I never I realized. No, it's coming back. It's, you're you're just the old one now. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, thank you, uh, and please welcome Michael. All right. Uh... Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Neil. Thank you to everybody who's here tonight. I'm super happy to be here. It's my first time in Winnipeg, and uh, I came straight from the airport, so I haven't seen a whole lot, but uh, we got another day or so, and, and looking forward to seeing everything that I can, and thrilled to be here, and thrilled to be able to, to speak with you um, about a, a series of ideas um, around architectural representation, but also around my practice, Young and Ayata. I have a, I have a practice called Young and Ayata with the partner, Kutan Ayata, who during the pandemic moved to UCLA. He now teaches in UCLA. So we're running that kind of bi-coastal practice 
where I'm in New York, he's in LA, our employees in um, San Francisco and our job that we're working on right now is in South Korea. Now, it's it's really hard and it's it's really difficult to do that on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's actually kind of one of the things that we probably shouldn't have or maybe couldn't have imagined prior to our world that we live on Zoom. And so also welcome to everybody who's here on Zoom. It's uh, great to be able to present to all of you today. Um, all right, so the titles and estrangements, we'll get to that in just a, a couple of slides about what it is that I mean when I use that word. But maybe, here we go. Do I need to click on something other than the arrows to get this to go forward? I can do that one. That should do it. You cool? I think we're cool. Figured it out sooner. Uh, okay, so a few terms just to lay out because there's a lot of things that that uh, that I'll say that that a lot of terms that I'm going to use that maybe have a, a group of associated collected uh, meanings for us. Um, and I want to try to define them here at the start, the ways in which uh, I use them and the ways in which I'm speaking to them. So one of the primary ones is aesthetics. And aesthetics for me and the ways in which I try to define it is Everything that has to do with the ways in which the world is made available to our senses, how we are uh, uh, experiencing the world through perception and sensation, both embodied, but also in the extended sensorium beyond the human body. So the technological sensorium, the, the sensorium extended to the non-human and all the ways in which it is involved in relationships beyond the ways in which we have access to within our sight, touch, smell, taste, and uh, sound and hearing. But aesthetics is also crucially and importantly how we make sense of our senses. So it also involves questions of knowledge, questions of discourse. Every aesthetic judgment that we go through is something that we go through with the imaginary um, person or persons that we are uh, attempting to maybe persuade or at least address in our mind and sometimes literally address in our minds with things I'll say here today in terms of the discourse that we use to evaluate and to express the values that we begin to find important in the architecture that we design. Another thing, aesthetics is not some kind of secondary sprinkles that we put on top if we have enough money at the end of a project. Aesthetics for us, aesthetics for Young and Ayata and for myself is a fundamentally, uh, it's a fundamental thing that we are responsible for as architects. The aesthetics of the background of reality, which is a huge kind of loaded and heavy duty thing to say, but we walk through the world, we experience our urban and, uh, and designed environments, and the ways in which they affect us are often things that we experience habitually. They're things we experience as the background. They're things that we're not consciously paying attention to. We're experiencing them in a state of distraction, and that begins to constitute the ways in which we assume reality to appear and to behave. We as architects design that aesthetic. We and architects are responsible for that. And that's a huge responsibility. And if you can change it, if you can alter it, if you can offer it to be something other than we assume it to be, then you maybe open up the possibility for people seeing other ways in which they can involve themselves in their cities and their lives and with each other in their environments. And that's a huge part of what we do as architects. So aesthetics as primary, aesthetics as fundamental, and aesthetics as the ways in which we as architects actually begin to have political agency. So this question of aesthetics leading to politics, we want to get into it. It has the French philosophers and things that kind of dive into that are kind of amazing and fun to think about and talk about. But in a nutshell, uh, a change or a redistribution to the aesthetics of the background and re of reality is a way in which new groups of people begin to identify themselves as being part of a community. It's ways in which there's a political impact to the things that we make as architects, as designers, and how they affect our sensorium, how they affect our senses and how we make sense of our senses. So we're looking at a slide here. We've been looking at it for a little while and after that, we're looking at two slides and this will be interesting. I kind of now, now that there's two slides, I wonder if there's some kind of format where you can mess with them just a little bit and uh, really kind of disturb the sensorium, but we'll look at doubles and doubles will be fine in, in their own way for the, the period of time that we're here today. Um, one of the questions aesthetically that we often ask ourselves is this question of realism. Now, realism is not intended to be a kind of naive copy of the ways in which things look in a given sort of naturalistic manner. Realism as an aesthetic movement from the 19th century till today often has to do with that tension between reality and its representation. 
We use representations to make sense of our senses. We use representations, representations as language, representations as drawings, representations as architecture to try to understand what it is that is happening and how we can interact with that sensorium. We alter it, it alters us, and that loop continues on and on and on. So what realism is at some level within the, the painting tradition coming out of 19th century France, but also the literary tradition coming out of 19th century France as well, and as it echoes into the 20th century, are artworks that uh, create a tension between reality and this representation that allow you or maybe even ask you to see what you assume to be the ways in which reality appeared, to see it, to experience it, to understand it in an alternate map, in a different map. So that sort of disjunction, that sort of tension, that sort of estrangement between reality and its representation, or that friction between the ways in which things are sensed and how we make sense of our senses, has everything to do with how we understand the question of realism. This was an experiment that Young and I did uh, almost a decade ago now, within the questions of rendering, questions of realism, and questions of the Dutch still life. And the Dutch still life in and of itself is a kind of fascinating thing to, to kind of dive deeply into because it's not like anybody just got up from the table and left this stuff there. These things are constructs. They're, they're uh, manufactured and they're manufactured through technologies of painting and through technologies of lensing, lens uh, projections, technologies of arrangements, things situated in relationship to each other, objects to objects, reflection to reflections, textures to textures, colors to colors, all in a kind of effort to describe the ways in which reality can appear as remediated through the representational system of the paint. Um, but for us, it was also a test uh, to see what we could do to it that was subtle enough, yet still disturbed it. Because that is not what the original painting was, this is. And that thing that was in there is a vase that we had designed, and a vase we had designed through a series of drawings and a series of 3D printing experiments. But ultimately, something that was there for us to try to experiment what it is that we do when we do something like render an image and render a realism and try to find the ways in which we can disturb that as architects. It's actually, in a certain way, an argument about context, about a building potentially coming into its context, not as something that is completely foreign, nor as something that is completely uh, in mimicry of the context, but as something that comes in and adjusts the ways in which you see and experience that context so you pay attention to it in manners which you hadn't before. Which brings me to this work. So it comes from a text from Viktor Shlavsky. It's a century old. I can try to do some uh, disservice to the Russian pronunciation of astronomy, but there's someone here I know that can say it much better than I can. Is my head not in the thing? Your head is not in the thing. So, Mike Heyer. Thank you. Is that better? Awesome. Good call. Uh, so, everyone on everyone on Zoom has been seeing my neck, <laughs> which aesthetically is is, you know. <laughs> All right, so maybe not the best neck, but uh, and that now hopefully we can hear each other or you can hear me a little bit better. Um, but the reason, okay, so this 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 title for the lecture of estrangement. There's been three English translations of this term. So for Viktor Shlavsky and the theory of prose and this this argument that he's making about what art can do, art is uh, something that. Uh, slows one down in one, one's perception, that reduces the automatic kind of consumption or the automatic meaning of what you're trying to look at or the clarity is disturbed, intensified, elongated, shifted, uh, so that you begin to experience it as if you were experiencing it for the first time. And for, for Viktor Slavsky, this is the function of art. It's something that slows things down, roughs things up. Now that word, what that word would mean in English, was initially translated as defamiliarization. And that has a certain sense. It takes the familiar and makes it unfamiliar. But there's also something a little bit off in that, because something about taking the familiar and make it unfamiliar makes it less known. And it's not actually an argument about making things less known. It's about shifting the ways in which we know them. So the other translation was estrangement. And estrangement gets maybe a little bit closer about making the familiar strange. But it also has all these other sort of registers to Bertolt Brecht, to uh, issues of alienation to the critical dismantlement of everything leaving detritus on the floor. 
which is important to understand the ways in which certain things are constructed, but also is not exactly what Shlosky's kind of valence and aesthetic attitude was about what this term would mean and what it could do within art. And so this other word here, estrangement, is another translation from 1990 from Benjamin Shear, and it's a neologism. It's enchantment plus estrangement. So enchantment with the world made strange. And that's the one that I like the best. And that's the one that kind of seems at least to have some sort of promise, hope, delight, enjoyment uh, with the ways in which things that we thought we knew can begin to become enchanted. And that enchantment uh, is often kind of what we hope for as designers, that it is not a complete dismantlement through a totally uh, uh, fully critical practice, but that critique can lead to a design practice that offers other things that can enchant us to the possibilities of of how we um, design the environment. So, some things that I'd like to present. Now, I have to say this quite literally, it's not like uh, for years and years and years, myself or Young and Ayana has been sitting down saying like, yeah, let's do estrangement. It never works like that in the first place. Uh, terms and ideas and theories and work and design, they come influenced, they, they loop back and they begin to spin around. And, and this sort of re-translation or different translation of that term really only comes into my mind a couple of years ago. And so it's it's not something that that even the projects that I show are decades older than I'm saying have aspects of that. It's not like there's a cause and effect there. So this is the book that that Brian was referencing. And I do want to say just a few things about it because there's issues that it brings up that'll echo into the projects that I show a little bit later from Young and Ayata. So the book is broken into three parts uh, based on three words that come from the Ecole de Beaux Arts. Poche, Entourage, and Mosaic. And Poche, Entourage, and Mosaic were the three terms that would be used to describe the processing of renderings, the rendering of an image through drawing, through washing, through inking, that would move a design from its parti, from its formal organizations, to its uh, final presentation to be evaluated at the end of the term as by a series of critics. So Poche, that space, that pocket, that that thing that is in between the inside and the outside that is hatched or shaded or rendered pink, that is rendered out of our attention to render something else to our attention is the, the term that, that we use. It's literally at some level, the translation of pocket, something that's between the inside and the outside. Entourage, all the things that are added into a representation to give it scale, to give it character, to give it color, to give it possible programmatic use. The uh, initially landscape, initially the ways in which it was bound and, and tied to its setting. And then mosaic, the rendering of surfaces, the ornament and decoration. But all of those terms had a whole kind of discourse that went around them. So poche was a way to read space and form or figure and ground or the ways in which volumes and mass would be organized in a city, would be organized in a building. Entourage was a whole kind of argument about what was and was not architecture, how you would render that what was not architecture, but have it be part of the architectural concept. So ideas of context. Mosaic was how one guided attention through a drawing. So sometimes it would be drawing explicitly the tiling or the ceiling, but other times they would be drawing where they wanted your eye to go. And so I think this is still uh, all three of these, which at some level we would imagine that modernism kind of rid us of the, the Beaux-Arts and all of its sort of affectations to rendering and imaging, but they got transformed. They got reinvented, they got estranged by modernism. And so part of the questions that the book asks is how are they still echoing through till today? So I'm gonna go through some of these fast and I'm not gonna go through the book in, in any sort of book talk sort of way, but just try to call out a few things that will echo into some of the projects that I show later. So this question of Poche. The question of the figural space within that is indifference to the mass outside, the registration of the figure ground as a concept for spatial organization, also has a question of what is being rendered out. What is being rendered out is the material. What is being rendered out is the construction. What is being rendered out is the labor of the building. So it's rendering out one kind of labor and rendering in another kind of labor. It is a representational technique. It's a technique through drawing. It's a technique through rendering that allows one to see one set of things, but hides and conceals another set of issues. Poche, alive and well in a project like Sejima Nishizawa's Toledo Museum of Art, 
only now that poche is uh, inhabitable by the services. It is totally visibly transparent, but it is there with all the heating mechanisms, uh, ventilation mechanisms, and also importantly, it's big enough for people to get in and clean the glass. So this question of what happens in the poche through modernism ends up becoming labor that is the labor of the services of mechanical electrical plumbing, the ventilation that is hidden within, in this case, this building's almost entirely poche. It's almost entirely ventilation because it was not built for people, it was built for machines. AT&T Long Lines building was just a switching tower that was ventilating and supplying um, power to all of the switching telephone switching mechanisms. And now is actually monitoring us through a, uh, through a whole set of nefarious surveillance techniques. But all these things become transformed as it shifts through time. And then as we look at some of the issues that this could begin to become something that unlo unlocks today, the world being scanned, the world being scanned through photogrammetry and through LIDAR, as we know, we are constantly being modeled. We are being modeled by uh, cameras in our cities, by satellites around our planet, by the things that are on, on our cars. Every car right now is at least four or five cameras modeling the, the city around it. So things that are driverless cars, things that are monitoring our commerce, things that are guiding missiles and military strikes, things that are doing archeological studies, things that are monitoring climate change, things that are telling us about the migration of flora and fauna, all of that is a world modeled after images and a world modeled after images through photogrammetry and LIDAR. Photogrammetry, if you don't know where it is, uh, essentially, it's a three-dimensional model of points in space through two images of it. Once you have two images of, of a point in space, that can then be used to triangulate where that point is and assign it an XYZ location and an RGB value, color and, and, and location. It's been used in surveying uh, for millennia, and it's at the heart of Manjin descriptive geometry. Descriptive geometry is ultimately when we think about the techniques of plans and sections and plans and elevations for three-dimensionally articulating a body through two-dimensional projections, that is a point in space known through two images. So it is at the heart with us of a kind of architectural technology of representation. So one of the experiments that we started to do with Young and Ayata is how to abuse it. Because we're not actually necessarily looking for the most highest fidelity, the, the, the most accurate way to use these things. We're looking for ways in which they can become creative tools, and often that is by finding the gaps, the errors, the omissions, the improbable images that are looking within the automatic probability of where this was built for and how we can do something else with it. So how would one begin to design a poche if the poche was beginning to be considered all the things that were occluded by the energy that is collected from the images that the camera is using to build the model? Because again, we call them photographs, but we know they're not photographs. We're using our telephones, and these are all built out of uh, images from my telephone, and the telephone is just collecting photons, and the photons are just energy that's reflected off the environment. So all the energy that's not computed by my phone is energy that is outside, that is hidden, that's in the pocket, that is the, the, uh, the possible analogy to the ways in which Poche, as occluded areas of space, can be thought through within a world that is modeled and scanned after images. And it asks other kinds of interesting questions too, which leads us from poche to entourage, which is everything that is shadowed begins to become a kind of ghosted space. So the poche is now not only the architecture of walls and floors and ceilings, but it is the architecture of books and pillows and chairs and uh, du uh, desks and uh, bookcases and flowers. So that the scanning of the environment through these kinds of technologies as a representational attitude no longer differentiates that which is the important thing for the architecture and that which is the entourage which occupies the architecture because everything is pulled together and smushed into one equally scanned data scape. So this question of entourage, and for a long time entourage, in this case now scale figures, would be radically differentiated from the architecture. And for Letter Lee here, the figures are shadowed while the architecture is pure line work. Um, if we go through other kinds of examples as we move into modernism, the architecture is drawn where the entourage is photomontaged. And one of the arguments that the book makes is that photomontage itself has become the kind of paradigm for the ways in which we make images as architects with entourage. That every, images, every image that we are building today is sampling things from usually the internet and recombining them, mashing them and bashing them up into new configurations. 
So this history that goes back through photo montage from Dada to pop art till today is kind of a fundamental act for the ways in which architects are rethinking the, the design of the environment through images by sampling other images to build up ideas of the ways in which reality can look. The other kind of aspect in there is the ways in which we drew entourage. And the histories of drawing entourage furniture within a plan was always drawn differently than the ways in which walls and more solid or permanent structures would be drawn. In this case, it's a differentiation, again, back to the Beaux-Arts between those things which are ephemeral and changing like landscape and those things which are permanent like the pochet. But here uh, in Giopanti's drawing, the, the entourage is a kind of radically layered over with trace, constantly shifting uh, notation of furniture with its informality and variability and flocking and, and nesting and clustering as a kind of difference to the architecture which it's uh, addressing. And just as a kind of concept, that has become something that has drifted into contemporary architecture through a number of means, through a number of avenues. Uh, one that I think is amazing is Haydock's Victims Project, which uh, if you haven't seen the image on the left is the image where the composition was dealt with, which were Xeroxed, reproduced uh, plans of each of the different um, items, we can call them pavilions, uh, incidents, episodes, objects, entourage. And their reconfiguration and the reconfigurability to a, an arrangement of this that is just so precariously informal that it could suggest that it is constantly in flux of being reformed and reformed again. And that kind of idea of informally gathering objects in architecture made from the informal gathering of objects into an arrangement is uh, becoming one of the more dominant planning mechanisms, which is interesting to think about it as against the planning mechanisms of the Beaux-Arts with axes and symmetries and hierarchies, this idea that it could be scattered, that it could be almost like furniture or almost like people or almost like the informalities of the ways in which things get together in the spaces of the environment and that that in and of itself could be an architecture conceptually formed from ideas that have their legacy within entourage. I'm gonna kind of move a little bit faster. Mosaic. Mosaic is the term again about the rendering of the decoration and ornament of surfaces. And often to make a distinction, ornament is something that attracts our attention uh, traditionally, whereas decoration tries to diffuse attention into a mood or an atmosphere. But the decorated plan or the plan that would be ornamented to draw our eyes to certain spaces, but allow our eyes to drift, move through the circulation of others, was this whole long argument within the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in terms of how to properly render a plan. Now, what would that mean in terms of how we render architecture today? Uh, I'm gonna use a couple of examples. This is a project that was a proposal by first office for the PS1 competition. And the reason I'm using it is all those little tiny dots, all those little tiny dots are a kind of uh, ornament slash decoration. Now they look like a rustication and rustication has a huge history within architecture, the ways in which uh, plaster or, or stucco or other materials could be used to look like the weathering or the wearing or the detritus of stone over time. And this looks like it could be a kind of rusticated concrete construction, but the, this is not a concrete construction. This is made out of plywood. And those are plywood um, panels and all the little dots are nail heads. So the rustication is literally the assembly of the, of the object in its awkwardness, in its sort of uh, ways in which it kind of um, looks like it is about to fall apart, uh, is registered as something that is actually literally the expression of the tectonic. So nail head as literal tectonic, but now as decoration to call attention to something that is not actually what it, you think it is. You don't think it's plywood, you think it's stone or you think it's concrete. And that in and of itself, that sort of exchange between the ways in which ornament and decoration would have been used to to rarefy one kind of architecture used to problematize or estrange another kind of architecture. There's other examples we can think about uh, within contemporary practices that are using large decals, oversized, uh, misplaced, scaled elements. And even now, as we move into the world of convolutional neural networks, generative adversarial networks, the whole thing that we call AI, which has been democratized through the stable diffusion models of of Dali and Midjourney, and now we see this more and more and more. Should we like it? Should we not like it? These are like legit questions, and we, I think we should actually get into maybe some of the things that AI uh, registers as 
both a level of enchantment, but also a level of gimmick. Um, but here we do see, uh, we see Notre Dame de la Tourette. We see La Tourette with the, the, the ornament of Notre Dame. And it is montaged at a kind of discrete level that is so fine that we cannot pull it apart. We cannot break its seams. So it has become another kind of surface ornament, another kind of surface articulation. Or the ways in which realism is being used within contemporary photography. Philip Scheer uh, makes these images that look like full photographs of final buildings, but they are not. They're montages of about 50 to 60 different photographs. And they're revealed. If you look at them, you'll know that that is not actually a real thing. There is an abstraction to the profile. There's problems all over the place with the weathering. Weathering, by the way, usually doesn't copy itself exactly. Here we have copies of weathering stamped across the building. We have reflections that could not possibly be reflections in those windows. We have markings that are stretched to become uh, an articulation on the surfaces. And all of that begins to kind of have a problem about the ways in which we register the realism of these images. And then this last question, which is the question of depth. And how does something like photogrammetry software model depth? And this is a, an experiment that consisted of three photographs and three photographs only of the Ludovici sarcophagus. And the attempt was to see at what minimum level does the photogrammetry software begin to create other kinds of textual effects, other kinds of registrations and other kinds of mishaps that we begin to misread as the kind of mosaic of the surface. Because ultimately what we're looking at here are dots and only dots. They're points that are mapped in space that become pixels that are illuminated on screens that become dots that are printed as pieces of ink. And in that, this movement from point to pixel to dot or from ephemeral mathematical calculation to illuminated RGB value to verifying Microsoft Outlook to uh, screen prints of 10 colors of ink being passed through a screen begins to become the world in which we are all swimming. The world we are swimming is this world between, are you still looking at my neck? No? It'll eventually go away, I think, if I can close it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so problem with preambles is preambles always take too long and they end up becoming half a lecture. And so that was a series of, of thoughts to try to tie some of the issues within the history of architectural representation, architectural drawing, image making, to now um, I'm gonna so, show a series of projects that, uh, that myself and Young and Ayata have done that, that run up a variety of scales from representational experiments to built work. So the first one is, um, so from 2019 to 2020, I was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome. And in the March of 2020, we remember what happened. And so they kicked us all out and we had to leave. We lost uh, five months of our fellowship, but then they gave us six weeks to come back as a kind of uh, consolation uh, round. And so this is from May uh, this, this year. And so I occupied this studio in the American Academy, which was the Philip Guston studio, which was a super humbling and weird thing to be in a studio where like, yeah, like a kind of mind blower uh, just to think that you're in that room. But I was lucky enough to be in that room for a month and I did an experiment with photogrammetry in, in this space to try to test out what would be the next thing that these, these kinds of um, experiments with drawing, imaging, mapping, modeling could do. So what I did, is I turned all the furniture on its side, uh, disturbed the room, dumped it over, and then set a time period where everything that I was going to work on had to be in the room. I had exactly six hours a day to work on it because the other six hours I was out checking out Rome, which is a great thing to do if you go to Rome. It's a good place to check out. Uh, and I had one week per piece of furniture to try to see if I could develop from that a attitude through this software to misuse it towards a painterly effect. Painterly effects of loss and gain of edge, painterly effects of marks in the matrix, painterly effects of color combinations. And what it resulted in was a series of drawings where each of these pieces of furniture tumbled on its side, disturbed in its relationship to gravity. The proportions of the drawings were the proportions of the studio, uh, began to now set up a kind of experiment with questions of the mosaic of the point. These are three resolutions layered on top of each other, low, medium, and high. So it's a point inside a point inside a point. It's like a little mini tiny Joseph Albers 
color study or Tin Price sculpture, and that that was what was used to get the color combinations. Uh, the issues of missing information being issues of constructed poche, uh, the layering up of uh, different views of these um, pieces of furniture as they tumbled. But ultimately, all of these experiments are about the background. The furniture, the piece of furniture is the MacGuffin. It gives my camera something to look at. And again, it's all photographs with phone. The point of entry to this stuff is very easy. If you've never used photogrammetry, it's like the easiest thing to use. You have a phone, you walk around something, you get 40 photographs, you run it in the machine. The questions come, then what do you do with it? So to me, it was the background of the room, the, the ways in which things at the edges, light and color that could not be registered, reflections at times of day that disturbed the, all the hexagons of the tile of the floor, that disturbed the registration of, of a figure, um, the ways in which shifts of geometry, because now it's a model, these are all images of models. So I can tumble the model into different views, orthographically, perspectively. And I can look at it from different kinds of angles. I can situate it in different relationships. And I can begin to try to understand what it is to work with the material of the photogrammetry model, which is ultimately points, pixels, dots, color, and resolution. And in the, that kind of combination of color and resolution, what is it that I could begin to work with as an architect? Um, we're pretty good if you give us a thousand lines, but if you give us a hundred million points, we get into kind of territory that's very uncomfortable. Like which point do you move first? It doesn't matter. And, and this is part of the problem that photogrammetry and image making raises for us, which is for us, for us at least, to begin to think back to traditions of painting, traditions of photography, begins to hopefully open up some other kinds of ways in which we can investigate these things. Because you're working with uh, filtering massive amounts of, of data and what you can work on and work with is different than the line of an edge. Because the edge is scumbled, the edge is frayed, the edge is something that is not there that is perfectly controlled by the line anymore. The edge is difference between two different colors and how it is beginning to be seen and how you then sense it and make sense of it is a problem for us to work on as architects. Like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, archeology, span uh, historic preservation, they're deep into photogrammetry and LIDAR right now. All the self-driving cars, all the petroleum, uh, all the military, all the commerce, they're deep into photogrammetry and LIDAR right now. Those things are being used to make decisions that affect us daily. Um, if we as architects are, are uh, disciplined that prides ourselves on being involved within the construction of the, of the environment and the ways in which it is modeled and imaged and represented, we need to find some ways to uh, enter into that terrain. Does this answer those big time political conceptual questions? No, it doesn't. It raises other questions and, and some of them have their own sorts of problems with it. But um, it's a start for me. It's an experiment and it's something about trying to find the ways in which they can challenge our assumptions about representation and push them into other terrain. Okay, next project. This is an exhibition from 2015 uh, titled Base Flowers. So it's an exhibition where we design flower vases. If you think about what a flower vase does, it does kind of typically sort of three things. First, it has to hold water because it has to suspend the life form that you've assassinated for your aesthetic pleasure a little bit longer than it would do if, if you had just left it alone. Uh, so it has to contain that water. Two, it has to pose the flowers. So a bud vase is different than a vase that, that uh, poses a large uh, collection of flowers. So each of these vases has a kind of attitude. It has a kind of posture, but the posture is not about it itself. It is posture is about the ways in which it displays these things. Because again, they are as we know, they're just animal sex organs, but we're bringing them to our grandmother and we're bringing them to our loved ones. We're bringing them to all the people that we want to uh, have enjoy the kind of um, epitome of nature's aesthetic uh, beauty and they have to be poised. And then the last thing is they usually try to disappear. They usually don't want to call too much attention to themselves enough, but really it's about the flowers. So the vases we designed were 3D printed multi-material vases that had an attitude that if you could nest four vases within, a, uh, within one, so like four sacks nested in, in another sack, again, this question of poche, 
that as you tumbled them, each of the tumbling would allow different kinds of arrangements, different kinds of attitudes, different kinds of postures and poise, from kind of slouchy to perky to reserved to uh, uh, in you know in different like all the kinds of different attitudes. Again, aesthetics is not just beauty. beauty. Aesthetics is multiple things. Uh, and as we get into stuff like the weird and the eerie and the strange and the melancholic and the horrific and the comedic and all the other kinds of things that have to do with things that might be cute, zany, or interesting. We get into whole other weird, interesting, there we go, used both at the same time, uh, aesthetic territory. So these were, were printed small as little bud vases. There were three printed in, in flocked out of, out of ceramics and, and other, other kinds of porcelain materials that could then sort of um, cluster and huddle together. Uh, the larger ones were a 3D printed plastic that had a kind of pattern, again, this question of the mosaic inscribed into it. And all of that to draw one's attentions to the vase. When really at the same time, what we were up to was we were 3D printing flowers. So we were inventing flowers of our own out of biological, geological, technological origins. And those flowers were what we were really designing. Those flowers were what we were really working on. But could you jack them again, like the still life that started the lecture into plain sight and have people not notice them first, but notice them second? And that noticing of them second begins to put a doubt on what it is that one should pay attention to. And once there's a doubt of what one, what one should pay attention to, you're entering into a whole nother kind of realm in which there's architectural implications. These are paired with a series of uh, microscopic zoom-ins, which were inventions in and of themselves that would zoom in on each of the flowers, uh, a little bit like powers of 10 as you zoom in, each time it gets more weird and abstract. There's something great about electron microscopes because you get closer and closer and closer to the, to the wheel. It gets weirder and weirder and weirder and looks more and more abstract. And then all of a sudden it flips and there's something else you don't recognize. So we did renderings inside of renderings inside of renderings. So as you zoomed in on the rendering, there was another rendering put inside there that would look more real or more abstract than the one that was next to it as some kind of uh, uh, idea that, that uh, closeness, proximity does not equal an intensification of reality and in, real, in the case, an intensification of the combinations of abstraction and realism, which is an estrangement of reality. All right, architecture. Uh, so, there was an open international competition for a museum for the Bauhaus in Dessau, Germany, and uh, to be designed and to be built for the centennial of the Bauhaus. Uh, there was 861 entries, and we were one of two winners. Uh, you should always be suspicious if there's two winners, just, just like letting you know, because uh, to cut to the chase, they built the other one. <laughs> but uh, we did go through two rounds, and it was a great experience for us. And I got to go to Berlin a lot, which was, was which was wonderful. And we developed this project, and, and we were happy with it. But ultimately, um, yeah, uh, we built the other one. So to tell you about what it is that we designed, we did. We decided very early on that we did not want to do this, not because we do not like it. This is an amazing building that Walter Gropius designed for the Bauhaus workshops and for the Bauhaus studios. Um, but if this was what was the cutting edge for a certain idea of an architecture 100 years ago, it wouldn't be the one that would be um, today, it wouldn't be the one that would be built as the Centennial Museum for the Bauhaus. And uh, furthermore, this was not designed as a museum, this was designed as a kind of, uh, as a workshop. And it was a very specific kind of mode of an ideology for the architecture of the Bauhaus. And this was not a museum for the architecture of the Bauhaus, this was a museum for the Bauhaus, and the Bauhaus was super weird. And the Bauhaus was this wonderful experiment of what happens when you combine new, uh, new technologies with materials, with abstractions, with experimentations, with a new group of kind of social collective of working together with professors and all of the kinds of studies that were done with textiles, that were done with photography, that were done with performance became much more interesting for us. And it was this that the museum for the Bauhaus was going to be dedicated to. And um, so here, here's how the design be began working out. Uh, first of all, this to be located in a park in the center of Dessau, which in and of itself is a kind of strange sighting to site a building in a park uh, is a different kind of way than to site something within an urban site. Uh, the strategy we came upon was that there'd be a whole cluster of self-similar vessels 
that would aggregate each aggregate next to each other informally, kind of clustering around and forming different relationships as they uh, huddled. There's a whole series of local symmetries. This is another thing that comes from flower arrangement, local symmetries versus global symmetries, pairs that are here, that are here, that are here, but are not global around the entire project. Um, and they were articulated through mosaics to have the, the feeling from the outside as if they were large kiln-fired ceramic vessels. Each of them having feet that allows the entire park to pass underneath. Uh, you can kind of walk anywhere underneath it and then light nozzles that point towards the, the sun. And there's this one sort of datum that hovers along that kind of flip between the feet and the, and the vessels that is the registration of the gallery floor. As you go underneath it, the, the textile patterns from Gunther Stoltz and other members of the Bauhaus become evident as a kind of uh, shifting and stuttering sort of warp and weft tribute to the colors and experiments that that legacy had left. And as you, uh, this is how you would, this is how it was gonna be made. These robotic tile manufacturers that can lay any pattern down, they usually are laying down kind of like cowboy sunsets in Las Vegas bathrooms, but you can send it anything you want and it would start to lay down pixel by pixel. So again, that question of how does, uh, how does a point become a pixel, become a dot, become a tile, become material, become something that then clads a project. This is the plan on the ground flower beds where the feet of the vessels touch down. There's one floor and one floor only for the, for the exhibitions, a kind of permanent collection, which is the more intestinal thing that runs down to the bottom of the page and then a temporary connect, uh, collection rotating up towards the top. The project uh, has this, again, this datum of these vessels collecting and huddling together. Uh, but something that became interesting for us, which harkens back to this question of poche, is how would you have something from the outside that appeared as self-similar objects rotated together, but as you move to the inside, would begin to unveil a radically different character? an estrangement of Poche, so that the interior of this collection, and there, there's a little bit about the construction, there are timber hats on a concrete base. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit off, off track with the thought, but uh, the point being this, as you had clusters of one, two, three, four, and as they intersected, you would have continually transforming spaces inside, again, the kind of po Baroque Poche, as you move through the gallery, where what you expected from outside became radically different from what you experienced inside. And I think this is one of our, our big kind of architectural questions constantly that we ask ourselves is what is this relationship between interior and exterior? And the fact that we get to uh, challenge, transform, uh, extend that, estrange that is I think one of the kind of wonderful opportunities we have as architects, the process of entry and the process of movement from outside to inside, inside to outside is a kind of wonderful thing we have for the ways in which we sponsor different kinds of possibilities for experiencing the world. And ultimately it's, it's just circles on a grid. The only geometry is circle and the only arrangement is grid. And this was for us at least harkening back to some of the rational processes of the Bauhaus that each one could be um, prefab uh, constructed, that each one could be shipped to the site. And it was all about the rotation and the intersection of how these circles got together and uh, nestled onto the grid to create these kinds of different spaces inside, modified and regulated by the thickness of the poche. So we built a couple of things, but there's only one thing that we built that has uh, for us. And this, this uh, again, I think you'll find us as you, as you start a firm. We've had Young and Ayata for 15 years now. And it's, it's kind of like you say, well, 15 years, great, you got one building. Well, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it goes like that. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know how else to tell you, but uh, uh, we've been working and we've been working pretty hard and not everything is, 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 is you know, not everything comes to fruition and not everything is, is exactly the ways in which you want it to be. Um, but also it's, it's, um, it's difficult practicing architecture and, uh, and for a lot of reasons that we're very lucky for, both both Kutan and myself have been teaching. And so we've been able to have this sort of hybrid practice that is both involved with academia and involved with uh, practicing architecture. 
but this building is built. It's a it's a seven unit apartment building in Mexico City, and it has uh, both one bedroom, two bedrooms, and duplexes. But the main thing that it, we're working on, the main place in which we had possibilities of experimenting with some of these questions that we're talking about today within the, the aesthetics of estrangement was in the windows, was in the apertures, and actually in the sort of almost a meter, like 0.75 meter of the thickness of the building. That was where we got to play because the plan was going to be pretty straightforward. The plan was going to handle what it needed to handle for a mid-market housing project in, in Mexico City. The construction technique was handled by uh, reinforced cast in place um, concrete, which is the which is the kind of dominant construction technique in Mexico City. If you try to bring actually uh, all timber or all steel in there, you run into huge costs and you run into uh, a completely different set of imported labor, labor that is expertise in Mexico City and there's some of the best in the world is, is cast in place concrete. And we'll get to that in just a second. So here you can see the plants, they're nothing much, but you can see those windows. Those windows are rotating into the building. They're kind of forming an inverted bay window. We likened it in a couple ways. One, as a kind of solid mass that began to be dimpled, that began to be softened, pushed in and out. And then the other was a kind of tectonic, the floor plate, where the floor plate began to be thickened and thinned uh, as it pulled the head and the sill into and out of the building. So we had a lot of ideas about how we thought this would be built. And this was the first idea. And they did a mock-up and the mock-up looked like this which is pretty bad. And fortunately, we had incredible contractors and we had an incredible local architect, Isak Mishan, who we were working with. And we went, well, we didn't go see the PSOC, but we, we started looking at world surface buildings and we went and saw a number of the Candela projects throughout Mexico, which are just extraordinary, um, extraordinary process in terms of thin shell construction, but also extraordinary in the ways in which they handle ruled surfaces through the board formed casting. And the contractor came up with a better way to do it. And this was what they did. They built each of the heads and sills because there's ultimately five that need to be built for the entire project. And they could have mirror images because the head and sill would be mirrored from each other. And from those wood uh, molds, they cast fiberglass. And that fiberglass was lightweight enough and flexible enough that it allowed them to push and pull it and reuse it around the building and uh, to deal with both the ruled surface of the head and the ruled surface of the sill. And that had this real kind of strange effect of, of the wood grain being cast into fiberglass and the fiberglass casting the wood grain into concrete. So now you're looking at concrete, but that concrete is not actually registering wood grain of its mold. It's registering wood grain second timed over uh, the mold actually being fiberglass. But that's what allowed it to have that curvature, to have that reputability, to have that um, controllability, and to have that reuse to make it economical to build and cast all of the heads and sills of, of, the, of the project. And so it comes out rough at first, but then it gets cleaned up and kind of tightened up and, and washed down. And in, this is a, a view looking kind of up the, up the side facade where each of these large windows becomes trapezoidal, rotates into the building, and the small windows are all operable. And the operability of the small windows had a number of different kind of uh, desires. One was we made the argument that if you did this, you could now have a building that when they built up to the lot lines next to it, would always have views obliquely from every single room in the project. And from that also, you were able to have cross ventilation on all four sides of the project so that each of the little windows could open up and the, the, the views and the airflow would begin to move across the building through it based on these, uh, these kind of windows rotating into the building. But to bring us back to the question of representation and estrangement, we're also really interested in the question of post shed of a building that looks way too thick sometimes and way too thin other times. And one move to that building could, could take you from something that looked like a huge sort of mass of concrete pushing into the project to a razor thin knife edge as it kind of hit the steel that is framing out around the window. And the other thing that became very strange was based on your perspective, trapezoidal windows would start to look square or rectangular. So the play of perspective 
began to become another sort of uh, thing we began to discuss. And we likened, we likened it to Robert Smithson's In Antiomorphic Chambers, which were a sculpture where if you come closer and closer and closer, they begin to suck your eyes out in two directions as they reflect mirrors uh, to infinity on both sides. And that sort of distortion of your views getting pulled in two directions at once, so that the spaces that would be designed inside, the living spaces, would have one window looking out the front and one window looking out the side. But because of the rotation, because of the shift of the perspectives, you would be looking both obliquely through and across the building uh, from the interior, so that you would be now kind of nestled out into the street with this, another series of pockets that could be used in different ways as you moved around the project. Did really strange things with the reflections, like that window there is detailed at its head and sill so that the frame is invisible from the inside, except for the operable window. The operable window has its uh, operable frame to it, so that it begins to become a window that looks like an object that has been jacked into the interior of the, of the living space. It allows you to kind of then get light deeper into the project, into the bedrooms. And it does this very strange thing as you come up close to it, where you realize you are standing inside, looking outside, looking inside, looking outside. And that kind of inhabiting of the poche that is uh, felt to be thick, but then revealed to be thin and reflective of uh, the movements in and around the, 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 the shell, the envelope of the project. So the last project I'm gonna share is the one we're working on right now, which is we won a competition uh, for an agricultural management institute. It's a large project, it's 6,000 square meters. It's in, it's in the provinces in South Korea. Uh, we have a wonderful local architect, Proud, who, who have partnered with us uh, to help realize the project. It's in construction documents right now. Hoping everything goes good because a little bit of it is out of our hands now, but just to show you some of the images from this project. So the, the first thing that to, to notice, it is that sort of, it's the weird looking thing in the middle that looks like a, like a ring with two legs or two wings, but it is on a site that's almost equivalent to a small village in this agricultural region. And what the Agricultural Management Institute is for is it's, it's a place that many uh, regional villages and agricultural uh, institutions would send their workers to, to both study and to explore new seed and new crop techniques that would then be brought back out to different regions around uh, South Korea. So the building is a ring and two wings. In the ring is the housing and the wings are the seed storage, crop storage, machinery, and all of the kinds of uh, agricultural technologies that are used to, to run the Institute. And it also organizes the site into four quadrants. So uh, each quadrant having its own sort of identity, each quadrant having its own functionality, but ultimately, the project is about a relationship to the ground and a relationship to the sky, to water. So the roof and how this building meets its site. This is its roof plan, which you can see kind of begins to have, uh, it's a shed roof that has two long slopes. It's not singular, but we'll get to that in a second. And here's the housing and offices, which are on the upper level. And then the lower level rises above and has a series of PLOT, a lobby, a cafeteria, and then the seed storage and crop storage in the long wings. The section though, which is this section about a relationship between a roof, a scupper, and the, 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 the ground, both on the ground, floating above the ground, and then kind of nestled within the ground, begins to become the kind of argument of estrangement within the project, because it made sense to us that if it was an agricultural institute, it would be akin to the kind of sheet metal type constructions that were there. It would have a relationship that both at one level needed to be in the ground, but at another level, depending on if it's a movement between housing and uh, the agricultural work, needed to kind of also distance itself, but distance itself by hovering into and around these mounds. And these mounds framing entries, uh, the mounds themselves are occupiable. Uh, the building itself kind of slouches over on top of the mounds while the roof moves and then kind of meets over to the agricultural portions. Forms a courtyard. The courtyard is really the shared living space for the, the people who are living there. 14 housing units and 30 people working in the offices. And this becomes a kind of shared space, a kind of courtyard of collectivity. And then there's the roofs that pull out 
and house the agricultural machines. And ultimately for us, it was about having the biggest scupper you could possibly ever have. Scuppers, by the way, are amazing things. There, there's Once you kind of get into the world of scuppers, this relationship between a roof, water, and ground, and the ways in which those three things begin to become part and parcel of a kind of argument about the ways in which rain and roof and ground are woven together. So all the scuppers collect into drainages, all the drainages collect into trenches, all the trenches collect into the agriculture. The roofs are these these big cut long sheds that, that are um, A-frame in their uh, origin, but shifted just enough to kind of tie them back to that ring. And that ultimately, hopefully, that the building would not feel totally out of place. A little bit like the still life that was the first image of the of the lecture that you would look twice at. There'd be something a little wrong, something a little too shiny in that reflective surface on the end cut, something a little bit too abstract about it, something a little bit too big with the, the gutter, but that it would become part of its environment and it would cause us to begin to understand, to experience, to sense, and to make sense of that environment in an altered manner. And um, thank you for paying attention. That's what, what I have for everybody to do. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Any, any questions? Ha happy. Do you have a... I don't know how to. I'll try. I don't know if I'm running out from the partner's office and saying no, but. Yeah. There's nothing? Okay. What do you what do you want to talk about? Uh, so for for the, the the students here, I mean, I know that I showed a some things that are let's say okay buildings, um, but a lot of stuff, especially a lot of the stuff towards the beginning, which is maybe closer to an art practice or a practice of representation. And I don't know, maybe I'd ask you, what do you what do you think about that? Is that still architecture, or is it? No, it's loaded for the, the person giving the lecture to ask you the question, but <laughs> just 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 what are your thoughts thoughts on it? Uh, how do we pick a site for uh, well for the for the agricultural building it, it was a competition. Oh, just pick up, um, you know, uh, for the agricultural building, it, it was a competition. So the site was, was assigned. The site was, the site was given. Um, it was this, yeah. So the site is, but it wasn't, wasn't organized in the given a chunk of field. Uh, some of these are existing. So part of the argument here was to, to build more things that like over there to have some of the program. So about this specific property on the This is this is a potential for the agriculture of the region. And just to, to use the building to kind of have a to have a strategy to organize a, a, a larger field than it actually could occupy physically by its relationship to the, the two wings kind of holding a corner and a crossing in a quad, and then the ring being pulled away from it and there being a juncture that you could pass through, but that those two sort of diagonally would become two separate worlds joined kind of at the cross, if that makes sense. And, and then as far as the, the project in Mexico City, it, it was a developer, and that was that was the site that that they had. Another 
I am very, uh, very interested in the basis of the world. I guess this is what the board will make for the presentation that the simple extract me anywhere and then it's going into opportunities and such opportunities that help me collect the practice and how the collection of studies Tell us a little bit about the the, the sense for the sense you can be very interesting mm -hmm. uh, about the, the process, uh, the practice, and, and the chicken and egg question: what comes first, what comes next, what is the relationship the, the artistic and the conceptual, how you get it from one to another, where you feel more comfortable, uh, what is next? A little mm -hmm. bit about the the, the personal aspect. Sure. Thank you. That's a, a very generous, very wonderful question as well. Um, and I, I, I guess the there's a couple a couple ways to talk about it. One, I think I mentioned both Kutan and I teach, and we teach both design studios and but also seminars. And sometimes the seminars are our research seminars around a specific topic and sometimes there are workshop seminars around a, a technique or um, kind of something we're trying to explore within within, a, within at least initially technology and representation. And, uh, and I think for a lot of the projects, some of them start with, with kinds of, how do you teach this? I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's a, there's a more sophisticated way to say it, but sometimes if you're trying to figure out how to teach it, you've got to learn it in a different way. And so in the process of learning it, either by, by trying to break like a technique or a technology or by trying to read more and, and research more about a historical uh, question or by just even kind of like a deep dive into certain aesthetic practices within the realm of art, uh, we end up coming up with questions in the construction of seminars and syllabi that leads to experiments by students that then force us to challenge our own assumptions about what it was that we thought was going to happen by that exploration, which then becomes fed into a project in the office, which then leads to something in the office becoming the start of another seminar uh, a, a year later or two years later. And um, and, and again, it, it, it is, we are lucky that we're, we have, uh, both practice and academia because it, it means that we have this we have the space that the practice doesn't we're we're not paying for our children's uh live life based on the practice the the practice can support itself it's getting a little bit more serious now than it ever has in the past but uh the that kind of desire for experimentation and for investigation and for at some level, for us, the drawing projects and the representation projects are just as, as seriously architectural as the built stuff. And even though they may never have to uh, result in a, in a physical building, um, actually, I think we both would, would kind of believe and defend the, the independence of a, of a drawing practice, of a, of a representational practice that, that is purely just like experimenting and trying to figure out what it is that we're doing with representation on, on the fundamental belief that um, what we do as architects is experiment in representation, experiment in drawing and modeling and imaging and, and writing and, and uh, that those things will have repercussions in architecture. But even if they don't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't become more meaningful or less meaningful, but they, they in of themselves were were valid and important for us to do. If that makes sense. The reflection on those three classes, like the schools are being that and you stay unexpected and refreshed from new projects and new ways of doing 
dissenting and trying to dissent in that picture. Where, where did it come from first? This idea of the cliche and, you know, say, where, when did you discover that? Um, uh, and I guess I've been teaching for 18 years at Cooper and, and I got my start the first decade was all uh, seminars on representation. And, uh, and at some level to, to answer it directly, uh, I began to see a problem within, within our own, at, at Cooper, but within architecture's internal discourse around what was different between an image and a drawing. And that uh, if to just kind of like make an exaggerated um, example out of it, Images were renderings that were, were, were done for communicating to a non-disciplinary specific public. They were done at the end of the project. They were something that was uh, suspicious, done for nefarious in intent, maybe to lie to, for some means to sell the project in, in lights that it probably wasn't, wasn't like. And, and, that, and that rendering itself was kind of looked down upon. Whereas drawing was disciplinarily valued, it had abstraction, it had the labor and the expertise and the training and the, and the tools and techniques and discursive language to evaluate within um, architectural pedagogy and within architectural history. And I started to doubt that. And I started to, to look for ways in which drawings and images could, could move in and out of each other. Let's try to look for what, what was the last time we had like a really solid language for evaluating quote unquote renderings or images. And the Ecole de Beaux-Arts kind of you know, within the history of Western architecture, you'll, you'll pass through there at, at some moment. And they had, they had a very sophisticated uh, language and in, in system of evaluating renderings. And uh, their renderings would often be things that we would now call drawings. And so part of this sort of distinction between drawing and image was just something I felt like we had to, we had to get over. You know, by the way, I, I'm not a fan of developer renderings that are done at the end for selling a project. I'm not. Do we do them for competitions? We do. But uh, the question of photography, the question of realism, the question of color, the question of texture, the question of all the things that come from what we typically think of as imaging uh, was something that, that both Kutan and I felt like had to be investigated in some different manner. And Somehow, it, 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 that's what that's what led eventually to this poche mosaic and, and entourage um, within the Beaux Arts. Makes me think, obviously, actually, completely different temporal different historical but, um, the practice that the Lucia had never arrived here at the idea with itself without having painted or at least mm. three crowds. And the painting, but painting is not just painting because I like paint, because painting is just painting. Was giving way, giving way to the ideas of projects and representation of real life of like sensorial environments. I, I love, yeah, I love that. I love those, I love those kind of practices. I, I think there's, I remember hearing stories too about Aldo Rossi uh, writing for a period of time every day before the start of the office was not. I got an 11 year old and a 15 year old and like, just like sometimes getting sh like the left shoe on the left foot and the right shoe on the right foot, like going out in the morning. So, so, but we're working there, you're getting, you're getting there like sometime, hopefully soon, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I share my own you know, basket of words. And the one that I find most is 
one I use with my students a lot, which is to be subtle. Mm. And I like subtle because it provides a kind of slight shift, but also it's a little bit, so it, it introduces something that is I just really appreciate the whole Thank you. Thank you so much. And and subtlety is um we uh yeah. We we're we're I think how else to say it other than um we're always trying to be subtle, but also at, at that level of uh, like the kind of um, sort of tipping balance between uh, belief and doubt. If that makes any other sense too. Yeah, like when do you when do you doubt when when yeah. you because when you doubt is also the moment you decide if you believe. Or right. we're, we're just talking about Andy Kaufman a, a minute ago, <laughs> and and somehow the subtlety of Andy Kaufman's humor, which was which was sometimes super aggressive, but the subtlety was. Wait a second. Is this is this for real, or is this joke, or is this I'm uncomfortable but kind of funny? Yeah. So there's I think I think so, and I think maybe that's also there's something uh, there's definitely something canny about Andy Kaufman, but there's also something um, he's 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 poking at something, and so subtlety is not subtlety is not a soft position necessary. Subtlety can be can be very provocative if, if done. Yeah, right. I just feel like the candy room is not so <laughs> good. to think about the unhomely. I know there was some more. Yeah. Yeah. One question from the chat. They said, thank you for the refreshing talk. You discussed ideas of representation and aesthetics of editing and for new practice in projects. Can you discuss the great experience in projects or practice that reframed or um well there are a lot that thank you for the question thank you for the question <laughs> my neck thanks you for the question um it's a good one and and you know kind of thinking back through certain things it's funny how it's funny how stuff kind of goes away comes back if i was to say one thing and this maybe comes back to the to the subtlety question um, I'm of a generation that went through undergraduate school starting in the early 90s, trained by hand, then worked in the profession for six years during a transition to, to digital technologies, then went to graduate school in the early 2000s, where it was all digital. And being maybe somebody who's a little bit nerdy about things like geometry and stuff like that, I got into a kind of a uh, certain sort of... Uh, let's just say hyper formalism around digital techniques. Now, I see those things as still latent within all of this work, but uh, there was a major reassessment we went through about a decade ago where um, maybe subtlety or maybe something else started to come in where that attempt to design the, the, the completely foreign alien object that was gymnastically expressive to the nth degree of its sort of technical origins became uninteresting. And uh, I think part of it had to do with with, ex with uh, experiments and representation. Part of it had to do with changing times. Part of it had to do with becoming interested in a whole different set of conceptual issues and aesthetic issues and political issues that didn't have, that, that were just not able to be wrapped into that, um, that sort of expenditure of, of, of capital around those projects. Uh, and it forced us to, to, to change and it forced us to look at our earlier work and, um, and evaluate it with, with a kind of hopefully a little bit of a harsh light to, to demand that we change. 
and to demand that we 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 find another way in which uh, aspects of what we're working on could find um, other forms of expression. That's, thank you for the question. Yeah. yeah thank you. People like me that are so framing the frames is that's very exciting. And uh, very specific question that I should ask. Um, yeah, in terms of and strange and when you think of that in terms of painting, mm -hmm. everything you work with you're trying to find the opportunity to very different patients to have this subjective emotion. And very much an opportunity uh, to, to, uh, to go open to that. But you also have a hard line service as well. So you're playing those painterly, you know, even color on the bottom. Time. So I think that that actually is excellent. Very aware of it. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, there's a tradi kind of traditional um, concept, a revolutionary cultural aesthetics. So either you go infiltrate and kind of simultaneously, or or you or you're violent. Mm. But I think you're you're in between you're aware of these two tensions and you kind of what you have to find and you have to engage with these two parts. And I, I want to ask you how did you make those parts? You know, what do you think it could be an offer? Yeah, like these thoughts. Um <laughs> first of all, thank you for the question. Uh super spot on. It's it's a uh things we talk about all the time and uh yeah the and and, and it's it's too simple to say that that moving from lines on on papers moving from a linear kind of figure ground relationship to moving to dots of color in a matrix is moving to a painterly but there's it's it, it's there and it wolfland is in there and, it, and the, that history is kind of cooking cooking in the background um because we are making when I do these, making decisions about uh, collapsing, collapsing foreground and background, and and shifting attention between foreground and background on uh, hue and on color and on density, which are super painterly. It's mark making. It's straight up mark making. So that's that's a very different way for us to work as architects. Um, so to, to to answer your question though, uh, so. For, for each of these, I'm walking away from the doodad, uh, essentially there's a piece of furniture that's on the floor of that studio and I'm walking around with my camera, my iPhone, my photon detector, and I'm taking photographs. And for this one, I think there was 32. So 32 photographs that then runs through a photogrammetry software. The one I use is called Adrasoft Metashape. And it builds a point cloud model. Uh, and I think this case was, was roughly 20 million points. Um, the 20 million points are in an XYZ space, points of color that have been given an RGB value. Um, where there is no points is where it cannot calculate. And that can either be through the occlusion of images being blocked, uh, me purposefully removing images so it, it can't calculate something, um, or the reflected energy is not within the spectrum that allows it to compute that point with confidence. And the confidence is the language that the software uses, which I love because I love software for some reason becoming unconfident. Like, <laughs> like ooh, like, I'm not feeling very confident about this point. But if you move that slider a little bit and give me a little bit of freedom, I might become more confident and throw something at you. Uh, so it's all these sort of settings within the software that builds that. 
Um, but then it's a model. So it's a three-dimensional model. And, the, and everything that you, you focused on has a high degree of, of realism. But the background, which is always being caught on the periphery of the images, is what blows out into these kind of anamorphic splays. So by focusing on something, you're actually working on the background because it is what's being caught with a less, lesser degree of confidence. And then the question becomes, when does the relationship between realism and abstraction become the relationship between signal and noise? And that's when it starts cooking into, because uh, ultimately it's all noise and the noise that we do not yet know how to make sense of. In a certain level, the 20th century is noise and we've learned how to make sense of certain parts. You know, Einstein's in Neubauten helped us out pretty well as did Swans and Sonic Youth and, and Merzbau, but we, in, in suicide and we can go out like then Penderecki and, and Verez and like that, that, that whole sort of way in which those things which were the background information that were, we were always overlooking because our technology of mediation never gave us a sensation of it became recorded, sensed, and then brought into organizations for a new form of expression, a new form of aesthetic that, that somehow began to become possible once that noise was given another kind of sense, another kind of order. So I don't know if that's like, that's the, that's the stuff I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about when I do it. I don't doesn't answer any of those things, but it's it's somehow trying. Yeah. Like the, like, oh, so so then so then I extract it uh, from the once I have a view which is compositional, like you're moving around a model. I can be really far. I can be really close. I can be an orthographic. I can be perspectively. I can distort it. I can be an, uh, axonometric. It's a model. So once I find that view of that model made from images uh, that I'm happy with, for whatever reason, as a composition of the station, sometimes it works better than others. Um, I extract it at three different resolutions, really low res, medium res, and really high res. So all of these images are those three resolutions collapsed on top of each other in Photoshop, which e with each of the resolutions shifted in its color values, so that you, so you're doing color mixture of marks on top of marks, and where you have a high degree of small dots, you're able to do one kind of texture, and where you have low resolutions of, if you get up close to these, there's. The resolution projector, but uh, <laughs> there, there's 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 a dot inside a dot inside a dot, and each of them is a different color. And and so and so then it's about filtering and mixing and and modifying those locally to begin to do uh, different optical things. Yeah. Oh. Psychedelic out. Uh, psychedelic outbursts. So, so the larger thing was. Thank you. Each of the furniture began to have a mood. So, this the yellow couch had one mood. The white chairs had a different mood. The drawers had a different mood. Uh, the table had a different mood, and there was. Um, I mean, you can kind of see them on the wall there. Uh, yeah, that's not going to really explain anything, but um, there, was, there was some kind of idea that, that again, in the, the Corbusier working in, in his studio in some time thing, I said, all right, one piece of furniture, I was there for four weeks, one piece of furniture a week. I'm only going to work from two o'clock until eight o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to walk in Rome every morning. And because from two o'clock till eight o'clock in the afternoon, the light from the skylight changes. So you get different tones, different, and you move by the end towards the fluorescent lights and the incandescent lights, because ultimately what you're gathering as raw material is luminosity and, and energetic data. So having the ability to study something over a week and then try to determine when does that succeed, whatever succeed means, I don't know, but when does that just like achieve some kind of mood? Next week, another piece of furniture, do it again. And, and it's just like the, yeah, the, the ability to have the time to like structure your day is, is such a luxury. So it's so kind of super 
super lucky to have that time. Yeah, I don't think it's strength if you first on the strength. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Super yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So like the whole time everybody was just looking at like the bottom of my neck. Yeah. Sorry everybody. I, I, You're just too tall. I'm just I'm just a tall guy. <laughs> but thanks for thanks for coming. It was a good neck. <laughs>